Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Steve Davies. Uh, my official title at the IA is I'm the head of education there. Uh, in a previous life, I was a professor of history, or as the Americans would say, lecturer in history at Manchester Metropolitan University, uh, and I still live up in, in Manchester to come down on the train to be here today. Uh, and of course, since I live in Manchester, as I always tell people, that means I support the football team from Manchester that plays in blue and not the one from near Manchester that plays in red. So, uh, Deirdre told you about uh, the importance of being widely read and widely informed, and I'd like to endorse that. And one of the things I want to uh, sort of say uh, or emphasize uh, is the importance of my own discipline, which is history. So how is politics at the moment? Well, the slide you can see up there is how most people think politics is. It's a total mess. Uh, as the Italians say, quel bordello. Uh, that was the headline in a paper after the most recent Italian general election. I always thought that meant what a brothel, but apparently what it actually means is what a mess. All over Europe, and indeed not just in Europe, uh, you're seeing the rise of so-called populist parties. Uh, populist insurgencies like the Liga in Italy, for example, the Rallyement National in France, uh, the election of Donald Trump in the United States, normally put in the same category, but you've also got parties of this kind in developing countries, Erdogan in Turkey, for example, uh, the, um, uh, one of the major parties in Peru, for example, or Bolsonaro in Brazil. Also, you've got the decline of established parties, uh, particularly the centre-left. Uh, social democratic parties throughout uh, Europe, in particular, have been having an incredibly hard time over the last 20 years, or 10 years, certainly. Uh, the social democrats in Germany are currently polling their lowest ever figure in the entire history of that party. To give you some idea of where we are and how things apparently have all gone to pot, if you like your politics to be stable and predictable, uh, the most recent opinion poll in the Times from YouGov uh, had the following figures. Uh, Brexit Party, 23%. Conservative Party, 22%. Liberal Democrats, 20%. Labour Party, 18%. Again, a record low for that party. Uh, the Greens were on 9%, uh, and the SNP on 2%, applied Cymru on 1%. By the way, uh, for the SNP to get 2% in a British poll, it has to be polling about between up about to about 60% of the vote in Scotland. Uh, and for Plaid Cymru to be getting 1% in a UK-wide poll, it's got to be probably in the lead in Wales. Uh, so it looks as though things are really, you know, a state of complete chaos. But in fact, as it says at the bottom of the slide, this all makes sense. If you are a historian and you're aware of... Uh, the history of polit politics, not just in this country but elsewhere, you'll see that actually this is something that has happened before. Uh, and there's a way of making sense of what is going on. And this period of chaos that we're in at the moment is actually quite short-lived. Uh, and it's going to be replaced by something uh, much more stable. Uh, maybe not attractive, uh, but certainly more stable. Because what is happening is that we're going through a political realignment. We're currently uh, about just over halfway through the alignment. We're in the sort of final phase of that alignment. Um, if you look at the recent Euro elections, you can see, and I'll explain more about this in a moment, what the realignment amounts to. Who have won? There were three groups of winners in those recent Euro elections. Uh, what I call national collectivists, and I'll explain why I use that term. People like Signor Salvini down in Italy, uh, Marine Le Pen uh, in France. They didn't make gains that were as big as they were expecting to, but they still made gains. The Greens had significant gains across most of Europe. Liberal parties also did well. The Liberal Democrats had a sudden unexpected resurgence here. Uh, Emmanuel Macron's party en marche uh, was, along with Le Pen's party, the major winner in the French elections. Uh, you had similarly good results for Liberals in a number of other countries, notably Denmark, for example. Uh, at the same time, the centre-right... Uh, and the centre-left both lost. And this is conventionally seen as being a decline of the centre, but actually, as I'll explain, that's not what is going on. As I say, what we are seeing is a realignment, uh, and I'll explain in a moment what that is. So, uh, if you're having a realignment, the obvious question is, well, what is an alignment? Now, uh, I think that, you know, you might think the range of opinions in this room uh, would be, Wide, but not that wide. But in fact, if you put up a list of political questions like, should we renew Trident? Uh, should we be in the EU? 
should we have, should we renationalize the railways? Should we have a broadly free market economy or a state controlled economy? Should we uh, have private schools? Should we have state schools? A whole range of questions like that. Uh, maybe say 20 questions. What you would find, I would be confident in saying that each one of you would have a unique particular combination of views on those issues. And that is what the population at large is like. If you look at all the different questions that people disagree about uh, in terms of politics, not that many people care about a lot of them, but some people do, uh, then you would find that there's a kind of unique combination of those views for any one person. Uh, to give you an example of my own one, uh, I'm strongly in favour of the free market, but I'm also a Republican, um, and I, I don't think we should renew Trident, uh, and I have other kinds of views which you know, people are quite surprised to hear, such as I'm uh, vehemently opposed to the death penalty, for example. Uh, the point is that there's always a whole variety of ways in which you can combine the views that you take of any particular issues. But what you find in every political system is that despite that variety at the individual level, politics ends up being binary. You end up with two broad tribes or groups who we conventionally call left and right. Uh, and this is true whether you have a first-past-the-post system or a proportional representation system. The only difference is that you have two big parties in the first-past-the-post system, and if you have a proportional representation system, you have lots of smaller parties, but they're still grouped into two large clusters. Now, why is that? Well, it's because, for two reasons. The first is that you can't have effective government or legislation without that. You don't and cannot really elect a legislature composed entirely of individual MPs and with no stable parties in that legislature. You just form shifting coalitions on an ad hoc issue by issue basis. That's not a way you can have any kind of effective administration. But also there's a fundamental binary division in politics and that is being in power or out of power. It's a real straightforward either or choice that. You can't be a little bit in power. It's like being a little bit pregnant uh, or almost unique, which is one of my pet hates by the way. Um, I, I'm one of the grammar Nazis as well. So what you find is that in every political system, there is typically one, at most two, particularly salient issues. And people sort themselves out into large coalitions on the basis of where they stand on those aligning issues. Uh, and typically what you have actually is two aligning issues, one of which is the primary aligning issue, another of which is the secondary one. But these aren't permanent. They typically only last for about 30 to 40 years, maybe 50 years maximum. And the alignment will be stable for quite a long time, but eventually it breaks down. And it breaks down for the kinds of reasons uh, I've set out in the slide here. Generational shifts. The fact that it's about 30 to 40 years means there's clearly a generational effect here. You get changes in the uh, interests of what I call political investors, the donor class, people with large amounts of resources who invest in politics. They can be wealthy individuals, large firms, large trades unions, campaign groups, charities, whatever you, you want. Economic and social change, particularly change in uh, the technology or the basic way the economy is organized. Uh, but also, crucially, the exhaustion of the older aligning divisions. What tends to happen after about 30 to 40 years is that at least one of the aligning divisions in society becomes exhausted. Uh, either one side wins the argument or people just stop caring about it. Uh, so in the mid 19th century, for example, Victorian English people were obsessed with questions like what kind of clothes did Anglican clerics wear when they conducted the service? Uh, this is because that was a stand-in or a signifier for the thing they really cared about, which was the relationship between the church and the state. But by the time you get to the 1920s, nobody cares about that. It's completely vanished as an aligning issue. Uh, and so what happens is when you get a realignment, you find that old alliances break up, you fall out with people you thought were on the same side as yourself, you suddenly find you're friendly with people you were previously opposed to, and you get a new pattern of politics. What this means is that the centre is redefined. It's not that the centre collapses, it's rather that what was the central position when one issue was the aligning one is no longer relevant. You've now got a new aligning issue, 
and therefore a new center. Um, now here is the alignment we had from the 1970s until recently. So this axis at the bottom here is economics. And if you're at that end there, then you are Ludwig von Mises or Ayn Rand. You believe in a completely minimal state that has nothing to do uh, with the economy. If, on the other hand, you're at that end of that axis, then you're Pol Pot. You think the government should do everything. Uh, so if you think about that on the axis, well, you know, John Maynard Keynes is about here, Jeremy Corbyn's about there. Um, you, can, you can sort of have fun locating people on that axis across there, but basically, that's what that is. And now, the other axis, the vertical axis, is the secondary issue for the last 30 to 40 years. The bottom axis has been the primary one since the 1920s, um, but it, there's also been, since the 60s, a secondary issue. And that is the question of what do you think the government should do about things like people's sex life, whether or not they take drugs, uh, whether or not they consume pornography. And if you're at the top up there, you're basically John Stuart Mill. Uh, you think that the government should not intervene in people's sex life. It shouldn't care about what substances they put in their body. Uh, it should basically let 100 flowers bloom, let people just do their own thing. And if you're down here at the bottom, on the other hand, uh, you think that the government should have an opinion about all of these things and that it should actually enforce rules about all of them. You're basically Peter Hitchens. Um, Peter, by the way, thinks that uh, cannabis is the cause of terrorism. Seriously, I don't know, you know, he recently had a, a, a column in the Mail on Sunday where he said, why is nobody talking about the fact that all of the people who committed the terrorist attack on London Bridge had been smoking cannabis? I know. Anyway, um, so if you look at that, that produces, four, that, that produces four combinations of views. And the two here, this quadrant here and this quadrant here, have been the two dominant quadrants, the two poles of the alignment that we've had. Up here, you have what I call social democrats. They're economic interventionists. They like the welfare state, uh, but they're pro-social liberty. Uh, down here, you have free market conservatives. They're pro-free market. They're skeptical about redistribution, so they tend to be skeptical about the welfare state, but they're cultural conservatives or social authoritarians. So if you think about American politics, Republicans here, Democrats here. And that leaves two homeless quadrants who are basically the swing voters who've been competed for over the last uh, four to five decades. Up here, you have the good guys, um, the consistent libertarians who are in favor of free market economics but are also socially liberal. Down here, you have, well, people like Peter Hitchens, actually, uh, people who are economic interventionists but also pro the welfare state and social authoritarians. So these are, the, in the American context, for example, these are the kind of people who actually favored a pretty big state and a lot of state spending, but because they were culturally conservative, they tended to vote for the Republicans, white working class voters in Rust Belt states mainly. Um, these people up here were the other group of swing voters, and they're largely uh, found in the metropolitan areas. They're more middle class, uh, typically younger. So that's the alignment we had. That is the alignment we no longer have because it's broken down. What we are seeing is this. The underlying axis of um, economics divisions is still there, but it's no longer the primary aligning division. The new aligning division is to do with identity, and it's based around the four, these four divisions you can see on the slide here. Large, successful, globally connected metropolitan cities versus rural areas and failing industrial areas or small towns. You can see that pattern of voting increasingly everywhere. There's a division between openness and closeness, between cosmopolitanism, liking free trade, being relaxed about immigration, liking a global economy, and nationalism, hostility to immigration, not liking free trade or an open economy, uh, wanting to focus more upon the national and the domestic. There's an argument about identity, about the degree to which your identity is something that you choose. And the division here is between people who think that your identity is largely something you're born with and people who think that, to the greatest degree possible, it should be the product of choices that you make. And there's the underlying big division, which is between dynamism and innovation on the one hand and stability and order on the other. 
Uh, and this shows itself in all kinds of strange ways. Uh, and if you look at the division between leave and uh, remain in the Brexit referendum, for example, uh, this shows up even in like the favorite brands of the two sides of that debate. Now, this is the new alignment that's emerging, and you can see four groups here. So on the bottom is the economic axis still, but the new dominant axis, the main one, is this one here, which is, as I say, about identity. And this produces the following four groups, and I think that these are the two emerging poles in most countries. Down here, you have the national collectivists, as I call them. People like Marine Le Pen, or Salvini, or others, they actually favor a lot of state intervention. Marine Le Pen's economic program was well to the left of other candidates in the recent elections in France, even to the left of the far left candidate, supposedly Jean-Luc Mélenchon. They're strongly nationalist, anti-globalist, opposed to economic globalization, uh, very strongly opposed to immigration. And they're also culturally conservative and authoritarian. Viktor Orban is an exponent of this kind of politics. The Law and Justice Party in Poland is another one. The Sweden Democrats, the AFD in Germany. Uh, you can just fill in the list. Up here are the cosmopolitan liberals. They're broadly free market, uh, they're pro-social liberty, and they're globalist. They favor, uh, they're relaxed about immigration, they favor a global integrated economy. They often favor supranational governance, like the EU, but not always. Then you've got up here what you might call the radical left, who are also globalist, um, and they're pro-social liberty, but in a rather sort of like strange way, because they are committed to a radical form of identity politics. Uh, and they also favor a state-controlled economy, mainly because they think we need to completely control the economy to deal with climate change. Uh, that's totally back to front, by the way. To the extent that climate change is a serious problem, what you actually want is more economic liberty, not less, because to following from what Deirdre said, that's the way you're going to work out how to deal with it. Uh, so, uh, but that's where they're coming from. And then finally down here, you have the remaining national liberals, as I call them, the traditional centre-right, who combine support for free markets with nationalism. Uh, these are exponents of what you might call capitalism in one country. Uh, finally, we've got how to, how to apply this to Brexit. Well, basically, there's three countries in England and Wales. First of all, there's Brexitshire. Brexitshire are people who are in this quadrant here. Right? Um, they are basically people who favor the capitalism in one country agenda that I mentioned. Who, what kind of people are they? They're older, uh, slightly above average income. They tend to live in the southeast and the rural areas. Um, they are culturally traditionalist and conservative. They're broadly pro-free market, quite strongly free market, actually. Um, and also, they tend to be uh, much less likely to have gone to university. Then you've got Leverstan. Uh, Leverstan is down in this quadrant. And uh, Leverstan is basically older, working class voters in the old industrial areas and small towns. Uh, very left wing economically. What they actually want is Corbyn in one country. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn is one of these people. Uh, and he's at the moment a hostage, basically. Uh, because, of course, his party doesn't agree with him, uh, and he's sort of like in a rather difficult position for that reason. Then you've got Romania, uh, and, but Romania is split between one block up here, the radical Romania. These are younger professional metropolitan voters who typically live in London, uh, Manchester, Leeds, Bristol, that's about it, or Cardiff. Uh, and they also tend to hang around in places where there's a large number of university students. Uh, and then you've got liberal Romania, which is basically the southeast of England, uh, the M4 corridor right through to South Wales, uh, plus a few other places, places like Edinburgh, for example, uh, and most of the uh, southeast around London. And that's the kind of new politics we're moving into. Uh, now, that is why, if you think about it now, uh, you've got basically um, I think the Brexit party is essentially appealing to this block here. That maybe actually is a bit of a paradox because I'm not sure that's where the people in the party are located, but that's where their voters are. These are the kind of people who are likely to vote for the Conservative Party. Those are attracted to the Lib Dems and they're attracted to the Greens. The Labour Party, meanwhile, is in the unfortunate position of being stuck in the middle here and being pulled in several directions at once, which is why 
I actually feel quite sorry for Jeremy Corbyn. Not that sorry, but still quite sorry. Uh, he's got a very difficult job right now. Uh, so basically, this is the pattern that's happening not only in Britain, but in every developed uh, country, with just a couple of exceptions. Uh, Japan is one exception, Ireland is another one. Canada was for a while, but no longer. The only other exception is Portugal. And what that means is that we're nearly through this realignment. And within about three years, probably no more than five years, uh, we will be in a new pattern of politics where the old alignment has broken down and we've gone into a new kind of politics where cu culture and identity rather than economics is the primary dividing issue. And my own sort of like prediction is that certainly in Britain, we're likely to end up with the primary choice being between this quadrant and this quadrant, with this one a kind of um, third force, really. Uh, I think this quadrant here is actually unstable. It's very, the evidence from France and other countries is that it's very hard to keep that together. So that's my thesis. You can uh, say what you think about it now. So uh, throw the floor open to questions now.